Sales, 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 something I don't, don't talk about enough and very much the foundation of my career, something I'm gonna challenge myself in 2018 to talk more about. This keynote's a little bit from 2016, but I think you're gonna enjoy it. Here's the full episode. So for all you salespeople, tag up your sales homie in the comments and enjoy, sit back, listen. It is dark. Uh, Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Excited about this. I think uh, when I think about making something happen in the world, selling something, getting a donation, getting voted for, whatever the transaction is, I always break down that world into sales and marketing. And I think that uh, I spend a lot of time these days in the marketing funnel um, and really helping a lot of my digital startups and my friends in digital marketing. Oh, thank you so much. Good reaction to the darkness. Uh, Jets jersey, that makes me super happy. Uh, I'm trying to convince a lot of people to go from uh, sales to understand the value of marketing. Um, but I'll tell you right now, through and through, when I, when I pass away and they open me up, uh, I am a salesman through and through and I've been my whole life. Big ups to the salespeople. So, Coming to a sales conference is a lot of fun for me and I think there should be more of them in our space because I think the issue with a lot of my marketing friends and people is it's very up in the clouds and it doesn't really end up creating the thing that I think we're all uh, you know, tied to which is the transaction, what is the KPI, like what are we actually trying to do? Um, I'm gonna give you a little background of where I came from for the people in here that don't know my story because I think it matters and then I wanna talk about what I would do if I was in this audience. I think what I try to do as a salesman is I try to reverse engineer. I try to figure out while on stage who the audience is. I try to figure out what Simon and Seth have, and Ariana and Frederick have already said because I know their spiels really fucking well. And, and I'm trying to think about what can I say that's different that is gonna actually bring value. And the truth is, and I know those four very well, Frederick I think is a purebred salesman. Um, but. I really do think that I was born very lucky and that I think my parents are very opposite and I think I feel very in kinship with my marketing and with my sales. And so that's what I wanna focus on because I think a lot of people here could make a lot more money if they eliminated two things. One, laziness, uh, to be very frank. And and two, uh, idealistic points of view of how they've made their money in the past. I think one of the biggest concerns I have sitting here in a world where I'm hungry to get one to two people, three people to get a lot of value out of this talk is the way you made your money before is my enemy. The way you've been successful yesterday is my enemy. It is stunning if you understood what runs through my head every morning on how little I think anybody should give a fuck about anything I achieved yesterday back. You're really only as good as your last at bat And the thing that I'm most passionate about, and I think many of you guys and gals can agree with me on this, is the landscape of sales and all of communication in our society has had a fundamental shift over the last decade because of technology. And there's just a lot of people that are doing things that are not bringing them real value for their actions. My my religion in sales is attention. Before I even think about how to sell you my SaaS product because it's better than the one that you're using or my wine or why you should use VaynerMedia at my agency or a new pair of sneakers or whatever you're selling in this room, mid-market, enterprise, small startup, the one thing that connects us is the end person's attention. And this is what I want to focus on at first. My career of being obsessed around attention started when I was six, and I'm not kidding. This is an interesting story. I was born in the Soviet Union. I came here as a kid. My dad eventually got a job as a stock boy in a liquor store in New Jersey. I originally lived in Queens, then I grew up in Edison, New Jersey. In Edison, when I was six and seven years old, I tricked, manipulated, sold. I sold, I sold my friends on the idea of standing behind a lemonade stand all day. And so when I was six years old, I had a six lemonade stand franchise in Edison, New Jersey. How many of you remember big wheels, those little bikes? You guys remember? I used to ride my big wheels at the end of the day every summer and pick up my cash like I was little Tony Soprano or something. (laughs) 
So I was a salesman early on, but it's funny, it wasn't, the reason my friends were behind the register selling the lemonade and I wasn't, it wasn't because I was fancy, it wasn't because I didn't want to do the work, it's because, and this is me now realizing this years later, it was because I was obsessed with attention. While my homies stood behind the lemonade stands, I walked up and down the streets, by the way, for a lot of the youngsters in here, this was the 80s when kids just went outside and did random shit. So I would walk, I would, I would walk up and down the streets and literally, this is how sick I am, I would sit at the cross sections of streets, Tingley Lane in New Jersey, Inman Avenue in New Jersey, I would sit there and I would watch people, I would sit there for an hour, I'm seven, six, seven, eight years old, I would sit there for hours and I would watch cars drive by and I would try to see if I could see their faces and I could figure out which tree or pole to put the lemonade stand sign on because that would be the better one because they would see it and buy lemonade. At early, it was intuitive to me at such a ridiculous age that the number one asset was the attention and then what I had to say is what mattered. That the creative, that the product, that the copy was the variable. That the thing I said on the other side of the phone was the variable. But before I could say it, no matter how good my game was, did I actually have their attention or was I speaking to somebody that wasn't paying attention? I believe that the far majority of this room has become disconnected with the reality of the end consumer's attention. That we have taken for granted, whether through laziness, not being compensated for it, or whatever other variable you are, not being good at what you do, I don't know. I believe that the market of sales has lost its way. It just, I think it's the speed of attention shift in today's society. I went on to have a very big baseball card business when I was 12 and 13. When I was 12, 13, I was selling baseball cards in the malls of New Jersey and I was making two to three thousand dollars a weekend as a baseball card salesman. I don't know about you guys, but when, you have four, when you're 14 and you have thirty thousand dollars in cash under your bed and you're not selling weed, you're a good fucking salesman. So, that was good. By the way, I, I plan on buying the New York Jets, which I think projected by the time I'm ready is gonna cost me between five and eight billion dollars, and I'm convinced that when I was 13 and had $30,000 in cash, it will be the richest I've ever been. I just couldn't even begin to think about spending that kind of money. Um, when I was 14, my dad ruined my life, dragged me into the liquor store, paid me two bucks an hour to bag ice. He now owned his own store in Springfield, New Jersey, and I went from like being my own entrepreneur and doing my thing to working in this store called Shoppers Discount Liquors that I hated because I bagged ice for 15 hours a day and walked home with 30 bucks. That was a bad, those two or three years were the dark ages of my professional career. When I was 16, 17, I was allowed upstairs. I realized people collected wine. That was interesting to me because I was into collecting and I embarked on uh, my career. My career took an interesting turn because I uh, discovered the internet uh, and in 1997 I launched uh, one of the first e-commerce wine businesses in America called winelibrary.com. I grew my dad's business from a three to a $60 million business in five years. I did it through sales and marketing. I did it in two ways. One, I was out marketing everybody by buying Google AdWords, by doing email. How many people here do email marketing? Raise your hands. In 1997, I had a 200,000 person email database selling wine that had 91.3% open rates. Right, yeah. Now, it wasn't because I was such a hero. Like that same list now is like 31.3. It's because nobody was doing it. And the thing that I want to talk to you about is the stunning excuses that my salesman friends make up for not doing Snapchat or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or LinkedIn content. I love my sales friends who are like, I do LinkedIn. I'm like, no, 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 you don't do LinkedIn. You sit there and you fucking try to connect people and you're a fucking spam bot, you motherfucker. <laughs> Not a salesman. <laughs> Fuck. Anyway, sorry. Um, <laughs> truth, truth. Like, I do LinkedIn sales. No, you don't. You just click buttons and you hope and pray and you control, copy, and paste the same fucking message to every person because you're fucking lazy. So, anyway. <laughs> Real estate, when there's a new vacation destination or a new town or Hudson Yards is being built right here, the people that buy first, if they're right, win. 
You don't get the beachfront property by waiting four years for what's the value of it. I am not, I believe that a purebred salesperson is never crippled if her or his actions are not fruitful. I believe a purebred salesperson understands that that's part of the game, that that's part of the hustle, that there's so much upside by doing a new tactic, even if you hit it once out of every nine times, the overall ROI of all those hours becomes a net positive score. And that is why I think I've been successful because my career in sales has been predicated of not being crippled by overworking to learn something new, period. It is, it is insanity, and let me use that word aggressively. It is insanity for you to disrespect all the social media platforms today and what they can mean for sales for you. You have to understand, if one person executes transactions through it, then you can too. The problem is, it's hard. The problem is, it takes time. The problem is, there's a lot of easier ways to do it today, but those things go away. Anybody here that's been doing email sales for 15 years knows what I'm about to say, which was 10 and 15 years ago, it worked better, right? It worked better because we play in one game, my friends, all of us. You're trying to reach that person on the other end, we play in B2B arbitrage of attention. It's just supply and demand. How many people, by show of hands, this is actually interesting, let's start with this. Let's establish that lying is the devil and I have no interest in your head nods, I want full fucking hands, okay? Here we go. How many people here now, in 2016, actually, actually hate it when another person, another human being, calls them? Raise your hand. Raise it high. I want people to look around. Look around, raise it higher, just real high please. These are human beings, our fellow human beings, who actually hate when another human being calls them. Let me tell you why, and then let me tell you why it's important for this conversation. The reason they hate it is because time has become the number one asset to every person in this room. The emerging pillar in our society besides the health and wellness of our family and money, the number one emerging pillar of value to everybody in this room and everybody in this conference and everybody outside is time. And calling somebody when they weren't expecting it has now become stealing one's time. Because we have the alternative of, when that person calls, you can say, just text me, just email me. I will call you back on my time. It is my belief that when I audit the sales ecosystem and all the startups I'm involved with and all the businesses I'm involved with, that salespeople steal their clients' time for their vested interests instead of reverse engineering the value of that person's time. It is in our best vested interest to send that email. It is in our best vested interest to make that phone call. We are not reverse engineering the fact that these people have become busy. Now, another thing that's extremely fascinating for me being in this room is I grew up in B2C my whole life, right? Only seven years ago when I started VaynerMedia did I go into the B2B world. Just for the people that don't know here, I have a 650 person social digital agency that I've grown in the last four years from a three to a $100 million business in sales, not fucking valuation. And uh, by the way, that's another conversation for another fucking day. And I think the thing that will be interesting to a lot of people here is I've done that mainly on not selling. Like we don't really do RFPs. I'm not interested in selling somebody who, I would tell you my number, like if somebody said what's your most religious sales tactic, it is not to try to sell to somebody who's unsellable. I think one of the most fascinating things that I audit when I look at the sales ecosystem is how much people take time trying to convert somebody who's unconvertible. Yes, your product might be 8,000 times better, but if that boss's boss is best friend homies with the alternative legacy software, you're fucking lost. (laughs) And then I watch people think that they're gonna convert it on merit. There's no fucking merit. There's just human beings making human decisions. And I think we need to get a lot less romantic about that and start being much more practical about the ecosystem. Let me tell you another way that I've grown that business that I think as, instead of pontificating and cursing up here, let me give you a direct tactic that I think a lot of you guys can use. A couple books ago, because I decided to write those kind of things, I wrote a book called The Thank You Economy. 
super interesting to me. It's the notion of if you provide so much upfront value to an individual, can you actually guilt them into buying shit? Especially if all your actions are predicated on not expecting them to buy it. That's the big part. When the energy of your tactics is to convert, you will lose. When your energy is to disproportionately bring value and let the chips fall where they may, you will win. It will change your behavior, it will change the energy of the execution. Let me give you a story. VaynerMedia, there was a certain CMO that I really wanted to get to because I wanted their business, right? I don't like doing RFPs because it's a crapshoot and we're not very good at them, right? And I have the fortune, nature of having a brand so a lot of business comes to me, but this one wasn't and I wanted it. So I decided to follow, and this is my number one, number one tactic for every person in this room that I am positive that if you actually put in the work and do it, that you will email me, and this is really, the reason I'm giving this is because I want you to email me in four months and be like, hey Brand, I saw you in New York at the Sales Machine Conference. I thought you were a little bit ridiculous, but I did this thing, and it actually worked. Cool, thanks. That's it, that's what I want. And here's the tactic. How many people here are in B2B sales? Raise your hand. Awesome. Coming from B2C, and now being in B2B, and being part of companies like Buddy Media and Percolate and, and Wildfire that we've had successful exits in and watching the landscape of sales in that environment, I've done very well with my B2B investments. I am stunned how much easier it is to be a B2B salesman than a B2C salesman. You literally know the name of the fucking person you're selling to. This is a big deal. This is a big deal because by knowing the name in 2016, you have the opportunity to use big data in your advantage on a micro level to create the world that you want. Let me explain. I found the CMO that I wanted on Twitter. Some of the people that you're trying to get to won't be on Twitter, they may be on LinkedIn, they may be on Facebook, they may be on Instagram. But the fun part is 60 to 70% of your prospects are on one of these platforms and putting out data publicly on what they like and what they're into. I followed this individual and I noticed that he was a humongous St. Louis Cardinals baseball fan. This is when my plan went into action. I started watching everything he was tweeting about. Ironically, I would, you know, I'm like a cobra in the grass. I'll tell you, the number one thing that I think really separates good salespeople from bad salespeople is patience. I'm patient as fuck, right? So I was staying in the grass, just waiting, collecting content, being patient, really mapping what he's into, paying attention. Ironically, it coincided with my fantasy baseball league, right? So I'm in my fantasy baseball draft. I've got the team I want. I've got a couple of empty slots on the reserve thing. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna draft this up and coming rookie Cardinals player for maybe other reasons than just winning my fantasy baseball team. So I draft a guy, anybody, any Cardinals fans in here? Any couple, maybe two or three? Uh, I drafted a guy by the name of Colton Wong, infielder for the St. Louis Cardinals before he was even in Major League Baseball. And so then I wait. And I wait for Colton Wong to get up to the major leagues. And I wait for Colton Wong to do something good. And then I see what I needed to. Him tweeting about Colton Wong. Which allowed me to jump into that tweet and say, hey, I have Colton Wong on my fantasy team. Isn't he awesome? And he replied, yeah, he's awesome. That's it. Patience, remember? Don't close on the first date, all right? So we interact a little bit more about the Cardinals, they're making their playoff run, and somewhere about three weeks later, he tweets me back and says, hey, I see that you're a CEO of a digital agency. We're thinking about, you know, maybe changing up our roster a little bit. Is this something we could talk about? We sure fucking can. <laughs> I wanna give you real data here. Less than an hour of work, being patient, spread off of probably about four months, I was able to convert that strategy into a $3.6 million paying client, right? Sales, sales, but sales not that look like, here's a blank email that I'm gonna blast. Everybody is obsessed with scalability. Everybody is obsessed with scalability. And all the action in sales is scaling the unscalable. I believe that sales, even in today's environment, is still a very face-to-face -face game, right? I think a lot of us agree with that. 
I think the biggest disconnect from the people that just heard that in this room, that have done that their whole lives, that were like, yeah, hell yeah, is that they don't realize that technology is now the scalable gateway drug to the human interactions. I sell, I'm going to Cleveland right now after this. There's a basketball game I want to see. And I'm going to sell on that plane on the way there because I'm using technology, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and these platforms as a gateway drug to create an interpersonal relationship. There are people I know very well that I've spent very little time with in real life, but I do that through those channels and then when we see each other, there's a total different feeling I have for these three individuals. These are people I could never even have a relationship with without this technology. These are people that I haven't even met more than once, but I feel enormous kinship towards them and the dude with the Jets jersey because because I've put in the sales work. Why do you go golfing with a client? Why do you eat a fucking steak with a client? Why do you go to networking events? You do it to create context at scale. You do it to create context. The absolute closer and the enabler and the jabbing and the flirter and the, the, that essence of energy is context. Right? If you know that girl's you know, boyfriend, if you know their interest in the Cardinals, you have a leg up on the competition. It's why you spend time with your clients and the decision makers and the influencers of the decision makers because you are building context. What technology today does and these five or six platforms that are the current state of social media do, all at the fingertip of your phone when you're going to take a piss or fly into Cleveland or whenever you want, ultimately scalable, you can do it at any time, 6 p.m., 1 a.m., whenever you want, however you roll, you get up early, you get up late, you can hustle in these platforms and create context. And the fact of the matter is, almost nobody does it. Nobody does it because they lack patience. They short, you, do you know how many of you in this room have a point of view on what Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter can do for your business and you've never used the fucking product? It's real, thanks for that one clap, I liked it. <laughs> and so we live in 2016, in a world where the majority of you, when you live like a normal human being and don't put on your sales outfit for the day, would never convert on the actions that you take as a salesperson during the workday. The amount of you that delete every fucking email that you get, that is a bulk email, the amount of you that will never answer that phone, the amount of you that would never, who here is super fired up to go home and go through their direct mail carefully? (laughs) And so I'm fascinated by the disconnect of who you are as a human being and how you act when it's in your vested financial interest for another human being to act the way you want because it's more convenient for you. That is the arbitrage. And that will always be the arbitrage, forever. So many of you have done business because of word of mouth, right? How many people here have landed more business because of word of mouth from a prior transaction? Raise your hands. If you didn't raise your hand, you just don't fucking understand or you're lazy and that's fucking interesting too. (laughs) When I think about social media, all I think about it is as the plumbing of word of mouth in our society. I'm fascinated by how much business I do with somebody after I actually sell them and what I do with them to create that word of mouth versus what I did to get them in the first place the enormous amount of energy that we all deploy as salespeople to get the business versus what we do with that business, even if it's handed off to an account person. If you were that point of reference, your ability to stay in that ecosystem and bring value is incredible. And again, I implore you to understand the value of public data. Let me give you a B2C scenario, but you can deploy this in your own world. Wine Library, before Thank You Economy, I wanted an example for my keynotes about how I was doing the thank you economy. So I was very passionate about having somebody buy something on Wine Library that was inexpensive and then overwhelming them with a gift based on their big data. I love sports, so no question, this is another sports story. Guy buys a case of Pinot Grigio for $111. We made 17 bucks in profit on the case. 
We had to find people with unusual names because we had to find them on Twitter and this was still 2011. So finally we found one. They were having a tough time finding people on Twitter that were buying wine for the first time. I wanted a first time customer. Guy buys a case of Pinot Grigio in Chicago. We made 11 bucks. They find him, he has an unusual name like Vaynerchuk, you know. We find him, it's definitely him. And we look and we find his Twitter. His whole Twitter stream is about Jay Cutler, the quarterback of the Chicago Bears. Just tons of Jay Cutler, I love you, Jay Cutler this, da, da, da. great. I tell the thank you department, which is something we have at Wine Library, which is not customer service, it's offense. Customer service is defense. The thank you department kicks in and we go and buy him a $350 jersey signed by Jay Cutler and we send it to him. ROI negative on that transaction, I think we can all agree. And so now I'm pumped. We finally found somebody, we sent it, I'm, you know, my keynotes are coming up, I'm gonna have a great case study, he's gonna buy a lot of wine, he's gonna do something, it's gonna be unbelievable, I can't wait to tell all of you. Three weeks go by, motherfucker didn't get back to us. <laughs> so I'm like, what the fuck? Ungrateful asshole. <laughs> So, nothing. I'm like calling four times a day, I'm like, you sure? Like, I know it's in spam, like, get the IT department. I'm like, this is impossible, nothing. I'm boarding a plane to Orlando, I get a phone call. Gary, I'm like, yeah. They're like, we got something. I'm like, finally. I'm like, what did he do? Better. I go, okay, better. They're like, listen to this. I'm like, okay. We just got an order from Plano, Texas. I'm like, okay. For $6,000 worth of red burgundy. I'm like, great. Now, that's great, but wait till you hear the note in the order. I'm like, cool. Dear Wine Library, first of all, what a great red burgundy selection you have. Make sure you don't ship this, it's hot here. Hold it for a while, ship it when it's cooler. Next, P.S. You sent my friend John a Bears jersey the other day when he bought some wine from you. P.S.S. I'm a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. (laughs) For very little money and for a solid amount of effort, you could go home from this conference and go through your entire Rolodex of everybody that you sold something to in the last year, go on social media, look at their data, and do something that shows effort. Let me tell you what's not effort. The at scale handwritten note that wasn't handwritten, it was just a tactic to fake effort. What about actual effort? What about actually sending me something about the Jets or root beer or Lionel Richie because it's very easy to figure out I like those three things. What people are underestimating is the word of mouth ecosystem that we actually live in because this thing has changed our behavior. I don't know if you've noticed, but we now have all defaulted into this amazing notion that we should tell the world everything about everything, always about everything. It's what we do. For some reason, everybody needs to know our two cents on the game last night, on where the world's going. This is what we do, we share now. You may not like it, it's the reality of the marketplace. And one thing that people share more than anything is when they are caught off guard or that they can feel that somebody gave them more effort than the market. My belief is that the greatest version of a person in the world is a purebred salesperson. Let me tell you why. My definition, one man's definition, of a purebred salesperson is one that is obsessed with providing more value to the other person than they ask for in return. When you make that mental shift, and more importantly, when your actions start speaking that, things start to massively unlock. I have built both of my very large businesses on one backbone, which is I want to know what this person's going to say at my funeral. I have no interest in selling in something I don't believe. I know for fact that there's a staggering percentage of people here as they become educated in the market they sell in that they actually do not believe that their product is the best. I could not function in that environment. I'm not judging you, we all have our different paths and different things, loans, mortgages, respect. I'm not trying to go there. But I would tell you that when you fully believe in what you sell, through and through, it gets a hell of a lot easier. When you actually give a fuck about the other person more than you, it gets triple easy. It gets triple easy, my friends. 
And so I implore all of you to understand that we are living through a marketplace now where our consumers have more information than ever. You're not gonna win a deal on inefficiency of information of our consumer. And so I implore you to start producing two things. One, leading with the heart and reverse engineering what your end consumer, whether they bought from you or they're your prospect, what makes them tick above and beyond being the decision maker of your fucking product. And number two, start thinking about the people you've sold to after you've sold to them and understand what they can mean to your business by you actually caring about them as well because they're still valuable to you even though you hooked up. Got it? Cool. I'd like to spend the rest of my time very honestly with you on Q&A, so I know that the mics are back there, so if you guys can start lining up, I'll wait for people to get back there, and please don't be shy. This is the part, this is why I don't like the mics that stand, I like to move it around. I find people are lazy and don't just want to walk back there, but please go there. I'd love to get far more detailed. Those are my fundamental principles on, on sales. I think it's stunning how many people have not recognized that technology doesn't replace the way we all sold. Technology is enabling the scale of how we all sold. And I think that's probably, if, if you ask me what I wanted to leave with more than anything, it's that. Because I'm, I still, like, I fly all around the country to close my deals. I want to be in the goddamn room. I don't even like Skype. Like, I lose the context. I need to feel the energy. But the amount of work that I do to get on third and a half base through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram is remarkable. And the context I have on the levers that I need to pull in that room, shit sold before I fucking got there. You like that? Thanks, man. That was a good way to end. Thank you. <laughs> All right, the good part. What's your name, my man? My name's Sean. Can Sean. you hear me? Clearly. Well, uh, you inspired me to leave my corporate job to create my own business because according to you, I'm 25. I'd be fucking stupid to stay at my corporate job. I believe that. So I followed what you said. But um, do, you I'm have, a, do you have the chops to pull it off? Well, I've been doing it a year and I've been making more money working for myself, taking Tuesday off and working on a Saturday because I took the risk. Mazel so, tov. Thank you. Good for you. All right. Joe Rowley turned me on to you, so she's standing right in I front see, of you. I see. So I got to give her the credit. Before, are, you gonna, are, you, are you willing to kick her a little commission? No. Everything's negotiable. <laughs> she made me read one of your books before I worked for her. I love but, um, it. Go ahead. I, right now, I, I, I help uh, sales and marketing work together. And yes. one of the things is uh, sales managers, they want KPIs like yes. calls, touches that yes. don't make sense. Yes. One thing I advocate for, like with social selling, is use LinkedIn touches, okay? Instead of uh, call metrics. Yes. And they're against it. And what you're talking about is even pushing that further right? Using LinkedIn, Twitter, other tools, but the, the corporate salespeople and even marketing managers and s directors, VPs, they don't want to go that way. They still want 150 calls a day. Yes. So how do you incentivize them or say, hey, you got to abandon the old KPIs, allow There's only to one way. LinkedIn? There's only one way. The CEO of that company has to change the incentives. Let me, let me tell you how quickly you can get a sales force to do it. Rem Every single thing that is wrong at VaynerMedia is one billion percent my fault, right? It's run from the top. You can get a sales force to get involved in social tomorrow. Make the KPIs around that. If you actually incentivize the behavior, they will do it. One thing I love about us, me being a salesman as well, we're fucking easy. Like we are reverse engineering how we get our fucking bonuses and our money. We are blindly, if tomorrow your company said, if you send out a thousand tweets that are not automated by hand and that's how you make your bonus, you're sending a thousand tweets not by hand and that's how you're making your fucking bonus. So the answer to your question, my man, is it's not in the middle, it's not in the upper middle, it's the gal and the guy at the top that has to change all the rules to the behavior of the sales organization and it happens really fucking quick. I'll tell you, this is gonna throw you for a loop. Yeah. I have forced some of my startups to add more calling in as a KPI because they want to go completely automated and technology and they disrespect the phone. Now, do I think the phone is losing in conversion? Yes, I do. I think it's, it's behavior in the market. Do I think it's zero? Absolutely not. Do I think it's silly to just have one move? Yes, I do. Awesome, thank you so thank much. Thank you, brother. Thank you. My man over here. Hi, Gary. How are you, man? Great, man. Um, big fan of your Snapchat channel. 
Thank you, like, brother. I watch all the time. Thank you, man. So um, from Gainesville, Florida, big tech scene there. Yep. Uh, John Spence, speaker, he's from there too. Yep. He'll attest to it. Um, so uh, I like I like using business as a force for good. Good. So that's like what I've been doing my entire life. Um, so here's here's a um, thing that we're doing now. Um, we do microfinance loans okay. for needy entrepreneurs yes. in East Africa okay. through cultural tourism, and we do it at 0% interest. I love it. So that's taken off. It's number one, two in TripAdvisor.com. We've got the Lonely Planet guidebook now. Yep. Um, so we're getting all the tourists. But uh, the other thing we do is we do we have a site called Saganet.org. Okay. We do uh, e-mentoring for K through 12 students to get them interested in STEM fields. Yes. By partnering them with partnering students, teachers, classrooms, and families with NASA scientists, early career scientists. It's great. Virtually around the world. Okay. And that's taken off, and that's a partnership with the Kosaken Foundation, NASA Astrobiology Institute. So here's the, my new business idea, and I want your blessing or your criticism on it. So I just acquired my dream house. You did. Right before coming here. I was in Montreal, I flew down to Gainesville, Florida, signed a piece of paper, and flew right back up here to it's see amazing. you, actually. Thank you. Thanks to John. Congratulations. Actually. Thank you. It's a beautiful Victorian from 1903. I'm going to turn it 1903 to, is a great year. It is. It was, right? <laughs> if you have some wine from 1903, I'd love to stock it in there. <laughs> I wish. Go ahead. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it into a boutique uh, hotel. Okay. 10000 per night. Okay. To stay there. Okay. But it's going to be a donation. It's to my 501c3. Yep. So everything that gets donated in, your fee for staying there becomes a 100% donated to 501c3, tax right off, and then I use it entirely. I don't take any salary from it to do good in the world. Okay. And on top of that, we're gonna, we have, I have buddies that have car rental companies for exotic cars. I got guys, yep. uh, other friends that have jet leasing companies. Yep. So what we're gonna do is a bespoke sort of system where we're gonna have the billion dollar package. Okay. Where you can, for one billion dollars, watch for this on, on, on uh, Indiegogo, for one billion dollars, you can buy a room in the house and you can give it to your kin. And for that, we'll fly you from wherever you are in the world to us. For, and then we'll, we'll show you what we're doing with your money. Yep. And then we'll take you any, every, anywhere in the world you want to go to see it in action. And then we'll bring you also back to Gainesville and we'll show you, we'll put you in touch with thought leaders, scientists, anything yeah. to make this happen I, in the world and make that happen. And again, it's a billion dollar donation any, to 501c3. Anybody, anybody who doesn't think that's cool is being silly. Right on. I love it. Sweet. So that's a blessing? Cool. And I'm, it's a blessing and I'll, t I'll take a. a uh, can, when the Rangers schedule comes out, yeah. this is in Montreal, right? No, no, this, is, this is going to be in Gainesville, Florida. I'm from, oh, Montreal. The, I'm from oh, Montreal originally. The, the house is in Montreal. Florida? So go Habs. This is in Gainesville. Got it. Well, I don't want to go there. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> and I'll also take a night in the $10,000 hotel. Cheers. Send it. Yeah. Cheers. Cool, man. Yes, dear. Hi. Hey. Thank you for the talk, Gary. I have a question. Sure. Just like you and Beyonce, we all have 24 hours in a day. <laughs> yes. And knowing that time is valuable and if you do your due diligence with clients, how do you, with your inbound leads, vet and qualify them to know how you can get killer clients on your roster? I own a digital marketing agency. Intuitively. Kansas. Yeah. Uh, well, this is like, and have you, uh, my other question, in case you answered that really quick, can you tell us a story about if you did your due diligence and you sent the $350 jersey and all of that and you get to the very end and then you lost business or a big client. Lo like lost as a we didn't get it? Closed and lost, yeah, and then any business that Closed, you, had it, and then lost it? You pitched it and you got really far and then it was a closed it Happens loss. all the time. Yeah. Just fundamentally not crippled by it. And just moved Like to I've never yeah. thought about that in my entire life. Yeah. I think the biggest reason people lose is they spend all their fucking time thinking about that and I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Perfect. I mean, it's, it's yeah. the truth, by the way. Like, like, on a very serious kick, and I think a lot of you are getting it, dwelling, dwelling on a loss, micro-analyzing why it happened, it happened because of 750,000 different random shit things that you couldn't have controlled or because you fucked up. Neither one of them is really that valuable to think about. I'm just on to the next one. Thanks. You're welcome. It's true. Again, I, there's some things that I believe in, like in purebred sales and purebred entrepreneurship that have clearly gone awry in the last half decade to a decade. Like, if you're a salesperson, and you guys all know this, this is why you're here. I mean, if you're here, you're not scared of the loss. You're not crippled by the loss. Now, some of you are more crippled than others. I think the most successful of the bunch 
are just literally unfazed. It's insane to me how, I was scared that I was gonna have to recall one for you, that's how little I remember them. And they happen every fucking month. We lose pitches all the time. And I'm like, they're just stupid fucking people because we're the best. <laughs> that's what I think. Hi Gary, hey, um, my name is Stephen Wilkins. Steve. And uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I can relate to you in a lot of ways. One just being because I came from a B2C world yes. and now I'm in a B2B world. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of different things and I think a lot of the themes that we've talked about in this conference as a whole and one of the things you brought up is just kind of caring about that other person on the other side of the table, right? So what I, one of the things I keep trying to think about is like how do we teach that to other people as well because I genuinely am interested in people. I genuinely love to help people yes. and that's kind of my philosophy on sales but we're all incentivized on that dollar, like how we make our own money, which is necessary and I completely get that. As we should be. But how do you then teach someone empathy and actually caring, genuinely asking how are you and actually caring I, what the answer is? I don't know other than telling every salesperson in this room, go reverse engineer the 500 best salespeople you've ever heard of or know and every one of them has the same fucking shtick which is they play a marathon instead of a sprint, they deploy empathy and gratitude, they're more patient. I don't know how to teach those things when it's so in everybody's face. It is so in everybody's face, it's just hard. It's hard to be patient because you want a new fucking watch. Like, this, like it's just real. Like, I don't know, and very honest with you, I do it, I put out content at scale, but I really don't give a fuck if any of you take it and go use it. Like, I really don't. Like, I can't come to your house and make you do it. Like, and, and by the way, it's called meritocracy and capitalism. The people that do it win, and the ones that still think there's some fucking short-term system that they're gonna be the one person that's gonna figure it out and crush in sales, they don't win as much as it should be. Cool. Hey Gary, is D-Rock here? D-Rock is here, he's right there. D-Rock. Stand up, D-Rock. You're the man, D-Rock. D-Rock. <laughs> the little plug for D-Rock is he's been shooting Gary live uh, on so something called Daily V, it's let's super talk, badass. I appreciate it brother, let's talk about it. Uh, we talked about sales today, I believe in marketing and branding. I put out a daily vlog two, three times a week that follows me around. It shows the stories of being an entrepreneur. People watch it, they like it, and then they want to do business with me. It's not super complicated. Like, so, so if you put out content, you know, it's one thing to do surprise and delight, the Jets jersey, things of that nature. What about if you actually put out videos or audios or written articles about your stories and how you were a good salesperson or your best things? Or it's, how do you bring value? I bring value to people in my ecosystem. I want zero in return because I know the network effect creates the return. So I, I run a DJ entertainment agency. We do events all over the city. Yes. And also digital marketing consulting. Yes. Uh, you inspire me to actually film kind of a day in the life. I just shot it on Sunday. Love it. And I, think the, I like to think I live a very interesting life worth sharing. I think, I think, just so you know, I think reality TV and voyeurism and human behavior proves we all do. Like everybody, the whole 15 minutes of fame thing is now that everybody's f famous to 15 people. The market's gonna decide how interesting you are. You're gonna either be interesting to a million people or 74, but it's clearly got an opportunity. It sounds like you answered it before I even asked the question. That's what but, I like to do. But, uh, you know, pretty much. Time's invaluable. What advice would you give to somebody that really hasn't created a lot of video content, has some following just, online? Just live it, just live it. Like nobody wants anything that's manipulated, right? Like just do you. Like you may think it's interesting, I may not. It doesn't matter. The easiest thing to do is to be yourself. It's also the hardest thing to do, right? And so I would tell you as somebody who loses, you know how I've lost business? I cursed in a board meeting and somebody was very conservative and said, Let's not give business to that fuck face, right? So, so like, but that's okay because I win net net. And I will tell you that it's really, the one thing I can't do is not be myself. It's been the thing that has absolutely separated me from the pact. Awesome, yeah. thank you. you. Got it. I'm gonna sneak one more in. Let's do it. Last question, I'm so sorry. They're like buzzing me here. Go ahead, darling. But you can hit me up on Twitter. I promise I'll answer it. 
Hi, Gary. Um, I work for a nonprofit, and I know you've done a lot of work with nonprofits as well. Yes. Um, what we we rely tremendously on volunteers, and yes. we're trying to monetize that volunteering, we're showing companies there's a value to that, um, and translate that to charitable contributions. Um, how do we honor the? And do you have any ideas of how we can honor that contribution of volunteering, but also you know surprise and delight those potential you know customers, essentially these corporations that have these charitable contributions to give in a way that makes sense for a nonprofit. I, um, I want to make sure I'm following this right. Give me a little bit more context, like go a little more detail. What do you guys do? Sure, so we sell opportunities for employee engagement. So team building yes. and so volunteering, but a lot of companies they say, well, we're already giving their time. Why do you want to also have a charitable contribution? Whereas the reality is there's a cost to running these events and there's also a value to these companies. And, and I see, and the, what those employees are doing is actually something charitable? Yes. So yes. they, right, so you're not taking them to softball games. That group is team building around doing something charitable. Exactly. And so the organization thinks you're almost double dipping. Yes. Yes. Challenging for sure. Um, uh, so I think, you know, as I think about that, what I, I, I reverse engineer, I think one of the things you need to think a whole lot about is the ROI of a cohesive unit and retention. Something I'm very passionate about is emotional intelligence versus IQ, right? I think one thing to really, businesses are funny. They like money. So the first place I would go is to run a report or analyze what actually happens to the retention of their employees if they actually do this. If you told me as CEO of VaynerMedia that if, on top of giving you my people during their work hours to build a home that I have to give you $10,000 but you're gonna save me 27,000 because 2.7 of my employees are gonna stay for a year longer and I'm not gonna have to spend money on recruiting and replacement costs because when that's the ethos, go there. The biggest problem is people get to, the reason I've been successful on the boards and NGO and you know of my work is because I've brought business DNA to the nonprofit sector. Like, let's eliminate the romance. Don't tell me the fluff. Tell me that I'm gonna save $17,000 a year by giving you 25,000 and I'll write you 50,000. Got it? Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you guys. I'm sorry bro. I'm sorry. Thank you. Keenan. Bye guys. Salespeople leave your two cents on what you just heard. Would love to get your comments. Let me know.